Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm Maddie. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator at the College Farm. Uh, I just graduated uh, from Dickinson in May, um, and I uh, was in Environmental Science and uh, Spanish major. Um, so, um, really exciting topic we're talking about today. Um, and uh, so, thanks for joining the College Farm, and a special shout out and thank you to the um, Environmental Sci uh, Studies Department, um, the Food Studies Department, uh, Certificate Program, excuse me, and the Archaeology and um, Anthropology Department, who uh, helped make this happen. Um, and we hope that I see a couple of people snacking in the audience. I hope you guys are enjoying your uh, farm grown popcorn. Um, so uh, thank you to those who came and picked that up today. Um, so today we'll have, I hope all of you had the chance to watch um, the documentary Gather. Um, if you didn't, that's fine. You'll still, I'm sure, learn something great and hear from a great cast member from the documentary chef Nephi Craig, who we're really uh, excited to have with us here today. You can see his little Zoom box somewhere in here. So um, with that short uh, introduction, I'll pass it over to Amelia, who's going to help me um, ask questions. Um, I just ask everyone before I pass it off to Amelia to try and stay muted uh, as much as possible. If your heart's really telling you to speak and ask a question, OK. But um, I ask you to put your questions in the chat throughout and any comments you may have. Um, and uh, we will ask those afterwards. So we'll have um, Chef Craig talk for a little bit and then we'll open it up for questions. So Amelia can take it away. Hi everyone, I'm Amelia. I'm a senior environmental studies and food studies. And I am so glad to welcome Chef Nephi Craig uh, Chef Nephi Craig has 23 years of culinary experience in America and around the world in London, Germany, Brazil, and Japan. Nephi Craig is an enrolled member of the White Mountain Apache tribe and is half Navajo. Chef, Chef Craig is also the founder of the Native American Culinary Association, or NACA, an organization and network that is dedicated to the research, refinement, and the development of Native American cuisine. Chef Craig provides training, workshops, and le lecture sessions on Native American cuisine for health to schools, restaurants, universities, treatment centers, behavioral health agencies, and tribal entities from across America and abroad. Chef Craig recently served as executive chef of the Sunrise Park Resort Hotel. During Chef Craig's nine-year tenure at Sunrise Park Resort, Craig and his White Mountain Apache culinary team achieved many national and international benchmarks in establishing a culture of indigenous foods across North America. Executive Chef Nephi Craig is currently the Nutritional Recovery Program Coordinator and Executive Chef at the Rainbow Treatment Center and Cafe Gougeau on the White Mountain Apache Tribe in Arizona. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. I'm I'm very uh, happy to be here and and uh, happy to share some uh, experiences and looking forward to some questions that you have. Uh, thank you for the introduction, um, the both of you, and uh, um, I appreciate the opportunity to share. So, um, first off, <clears throat> first off, I want to thank you all for supporting the the film Gather and uh, making it accessible to uh, a wider audience and. Um, as it relates to your own um, career choice and life work, uh, I really appreciate it. Please continue doing that. That's one of the best ways to um, support this, uh, this uh, indigenous food, uh, food sovereignty movement that's happening across Native America, North and South America. Um, but so thank you for supporting the film and uh, I hope you took away some, some good insight and good info from it. Um, so just, just to kind of uh, situate my experience and my perspective, uh, kind of give you a little insight into who I am and the work that I do. I'll just, I'll just begin by telling you a little bit about my journey as, as, a, as a cook and a community member. Um, so I, be, I began cooking straight out of high school. Um, I didn't really know what I was gonna do with my life. You know, I was gonna, I'm gonna take a year off and you know, all that normal BS, but 
it didn't work out well, you know what I mean? It didn't work out and I had to make a decision. Um, but food had always really been a part of my life. My grandfather grew a garden um, on the Apache Res and it was back in the eighties uh, when I was just a little kid and, and um, it was out of pure necessity. Um, my grandfather had spent some time at the Carlisle School in Pennsylvania, the, uh, that, that uh, very militaristic template school for all the other Native American boarding schools. And it began with um, uh, Richard Henry Pratt. Uh, his motto was kill the Indian, save the man for that school. And um, so he, my grandfather, Joseph Ivins was there and on his journey home from the East Coast, he stopped and stayed in Anadarko, Oklahoma. And there he would uh, befriend some of the other Apache bands that were in Anadarko and um, you know, uh, pick up some techniques and tools along the way. And one of those uh, skills that he brought home to, to the White Mountain Apache tribe in Arizona was, was farming and agriculture. So um, my earliest memories uh, include being at what we all call grandpa's garden and uh, climbing the pear trees, you know, helping to play in the mud and the, the corn and the, the squash and that kind of stuff. Um, but what was really neat is that it was just out of pure necessity, right? And my, my family also grew uh, vegetables in our backyard too every summer. So it was, it was just kind of there, you know what I mean? And it was just there. I didn't know when I was a little kid, I was, our family was poor, you know, it's just, just how it was. But um, I always enjoyed cooking. I, my, uh, my passion for baking when I was a little boy started with my mom. I used to bake cookies and brownies with her and put them in little bags and load them up in my, in an ice chest and throw them in my, my wagon and sell them in my neighborhood, you know? And that's how I made a couple extra bucks. And I thought it was cool that I could take my hands and make something neat, something that was, I like to eat and then sell it and make some money. And that, that made a big impression. Um, but uh, like I said, after high school, I, I decided I didn't really know what I was going to do. And I decided to um, go to cooking school. I was really kind of heavily influenced by those early childhood memories of food and farming, but also really even influenced by this old TV show on the Discovery Channel called Great Chefs of the World. Um, really cool classic um, cooking series. Um, not Nothing like the Food Network is today, you know, it's just like a real mechanical demonstration of chefs doing cooking demos in their kitchens and uh, it's real, real cool. So I like that. Um, then when I got into school, I, I noticed right away that there was no mention of native peoples, uh, no mention of who we were and what we believed or any of the food contributions. And uh, I had known there was all this kind of um, this information growing up. Um, from growing up around food on the White Mountain Apache tribe, and then also growing up on the Navajo Nation on my father's side. Um, so there, our, our world, I guess our foodscape or our food world is really colored by philosophy and spiritual um, information and ceremony and, and songs and creation story, because food revolves around all of that. I mean, everything revolves around food in the native universe and uh, land. So um, there was this like supplemental skill set that I had going into cooking school, but it wasn't recognized or even acknowledged or respected, right? Um, so that when I, when I first uh, met one of my instructors, I asked them like, hey chef, is there such thing as a Native American cuisine? And uh, his response was, well, I know you make fry bread. I, I know you guys boil stew, you know? I was like, do you like fry bread? And he's like, nah, you know, he's like got a real dismissive attitude. And to me, I got the message. I mean, it meant don't talk about it. You know, I don't know anything about you. So don't talk about it. <laughs> don't make me look stupid. <laughs> but, um, but that would stick with me that that impression uh, of being dismissed and our, our culinary legacy being dismissed. So being a young, you know, skateboarder and kind of a, a, a rebellious kid, I was like, well, I'm going to go ahead and just, you know, F that, I'm gonna do something on my own, you know? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm gonna start something. And because by the time, I, when I was in cooking school, I heard um, chefs being referred to as master chefs. And the only other place I had heard that word used was like uh, master carpenter, master painter, um, um, kung fu master, right? Martial arts master, that, uh, or like uh, master ballerinas, right? Master dancers. I had only heard it used in the context of arts. 
So to me, when I got to cooking school, I thought it was real cool. I was like, wow, man, you can become a master chef. Like my mind went to Kung Fu and martial arts, you know, I was like, dang, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty rad. So um, I decided that that's, I was going to go classical in my perspective on training. And so I began to really delve into classical French cuisine and that's what the curriculum taught anyway. But my choice of study outside of the curriculum in school was really trying to master classical French style. And so um, because I knew that, that that's the cuisine in the, in the late 90s that would open doors and that was like the, the pinnacle of American fine dining, right? So, but all along the way, I knew in my heart that I wanted to do something with native foods. I just didn't know how. I didn't even know if other native chefs existed like in the professional setting. I knew there were master cooks all over my community that could, you know, um, harvest corn and know how to cook it and cowboy cooks and grandmas, you know, master grandma chefs, you know. Um, but I didn't know about, you know, chefs in white uniforms. Um, so it, I started in a concept called the Native American Culinary Association um, in like 1999 in a sketchbook of mine. And um, I was able, really fortunate to get into a really uh, high caliber kitchen by the time I was uh, 20, 22 years old into a place called Mary Elaine's of the Phoenician. And that was a five star, five diamond property. And every year from 98, 99, 2000, 2001, and 2002, I would apply at that, that resort like twice a year sometimes. And every year I'd get turned down. Um, and it wasn't until I knew a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy who got me a, a stage. Um, a stage is where you you just like a fly on the wall and you're hanging out working for free and observing. Um, but at the end of the stage, uh, the head chef um, took me out of the dining room, asked how my experience was and and offered me a position. You know, it freaked me out. I, I couldn't believe it. And I accepted on the spot. And um, that that experience there really taught me how to cook without cooking. I saw the other chefs sit down and talk about what they wanted to convey through a tasting menu or through dishes. And I would carry out their, 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 I would carry out the technical aspect as a line cook. And so I would begin to see philosophy was formed in a kitchen with a team. And, um, and it was really high caliber. If, if Michelin was in the United States, it might've been a two star, maybe three star restaurant, uh, but it was five star, five diamond. And um, the important thing, and the reason I'm bringing that up there, bringing that up is because uh, that, when I got into that kitchen, there were two very important indigenous foods on the menu, on, on, this, on the meat station that I would begin to work on, was a, a dish, a, it's a classically called beef turnitos rossini. And it was being reinterpreted with, um, with buffalo tenderloin. Uh, from one from the from like the Cheyenne River tribe area and the inter bison cooperative areas uh, where they produce the buffalo, and then right next to the fish thing was a um, a classic salmon roulade that was being uh, done with uh, Quinault River salmon from the Pacific Northwest, and on the box that the that the salmon was fished on ice to us, it had that. Quinault River salmon in the tribal art. And I was like, wow, man, check it out. That's native, you know? And so many other ingredients I recognize as indigenous cultivars or special cultural foods were at that very high level. So that was a very validating moment of my indigenous experience and my plight. So that gave me, a, um, after over a year there, that gave me some, um, a lot of confidence to go ahead and go public with the concept of Naka. And that's the year that I, I left when my son, my first son was born and just started working freelance. And Native Foods, this was in 2003, um, when I began to work freelance as, as an independent contractor, Native Foods opened up all these different doors. I had to really decolonize my fine dining thinking. And I couldn't go to the hero chefs I had, I, I admired like, you know, Thomas Keller, Daniel Belouge, Jean George, all these, you know, high caliber American and French chefs. I had to, you know, like I say in the film, I had to go home and talk to grandma and aunties and uncles and, you know, really start to learn the language again, and just really kind of humble myself from the, the height I had climbed, then come to like get grassroots and really get, get into the work. Um, so that would continue for um, 2003 to 2006. Um, and then 2006 and seven, nearing 2008, I was traveling abroad 
I worked for a lot of different agencies and organizations from schools to museums to universities to uh, hotels and large operations and small restaurants, uh, training and teaching native foods. Um, and um, throughout this whole journey, uh, it ultimately kind of culminated that year where I was able to work in London and Japan and Brazil and um, um, all over these places. But this journey really um, didn't, this, this long path of training really uh, was forged and um, the, the, the way that I have my perspective now is in 2000, um, 2009, I came back to the White Mountain Apache tribe and um, because I was struggling in the city, I was, you know, unemployable and I was just kind of just floating around. And um, I got a job at our, our tribal ski resort. And this was the first time as a line cook, right? This is the first time that I got to be in a kitchen from top to bottom, management to, you know, dishwashers. Everybody was White Mountain Apache or, or some other tribal affiliation. Everyone was brown like me. and I didn't know it, but I had been searching for that, that element. And it was like, wow, man, everybody here is White Mountain Apache. They get it, they understand me. You know, granted the food was like powdered mashed potatoes and it was a dirty old kitchen and whatever, you know? But um, I would apply, uh, that, that chef's position would vacate and I would, I would be encouraged to apply than I did and I got hired as the head chef in 2009. Oh uh, yeah, 2009. And um, I was, my perspective on that place was like, I'm just going to stay for a year and put on my resume and bounce when we get back to the city. And um, this, this hotel is like that movie, Hot Tub Time Machine, you know, like <laughs> where nothing had changed since the 80s, you know. And, um, but it was cool because everyone was Apache. And um, what, uh, what really, um, what really began to change my perspective on food and cooking was that. I began to see firsthand how foods, native foods like corn that was grown locally like this could be used to enhance people's lives and their connection and how skill building through cooking um, with my own people really made a, a profound emotional impact and developed character. And to me, that really kept me there. And I would ultimately end up staying there for almost nine years at that position at ex as executive chef. Uh, two bars, two restaurants. It was like a 110 room hotel. And um, my team was like 34 people. Um, we did breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week. It was nuts, you know. Um, but um, in 2010, my, my father uh, was diagnosed with cancer and, 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 and passed away. He died. And that loss was very profound. And it was very scary. I, my dad had been there as a support for me throughout my whole life and my career. And all of that work and travel and training, substance abuse was always a part of the picture uh, for me. I, unfortunately, I was somewhat high functioning and I could perform until it all came crashing down, you know? And so when my father passed away, he died in his sobriety. And he was, as he was in hospice, we would talk about, um, you know, like, man, you're gonna do it, dad, you know, like still sober, you know? And he would, you know, say, you, you got to stick with it too. Um, but it wasn't until after um, I lost him to, to that, that it really became apparent I needed to do it on my own. So filling the void and dealing with alcoholism and addiction and then losing my dad, um, it, it really left this big void. And over the, and from 2010 until 2016, native foods being in our high mountains really helped to fill those connections that I needed of guidance and um, and I got sober right I got clean I stopped using so my heart softened and my perspective widened and I'm looking for spiritual growth right and I'm starting to get this through the mountains and through the foods and through my team through our successes and our failures um, and it really began to switch like and I would turn down opportunities to go other places uh, like to the east coast or the west coast and set up shop and do native foods but I always felt like if I did that, I would be just like a puppet. I'd just be dancing and cooking for non-natives. You know what I mean? Just be like someone's puppet. Someone invested in me and they own me because they, you know, you know, use their money. Um, but I saw firsthand 
what Native Foods was doing for a group of humble Apaches that came from the res that could care less about famous chefs and Food and Wine magazine or Zagat or Mobile or, or you know, any of these accolades out there. It was just us in our own kitchen doing our own thing, working with Native Foods. And uh, the heartbreak and the triumph of doing that together was, was really um, important. And so um, a position would open up at the, our treatment center and I was invited to do a keynote address on native foods and recovery uh, or on recovery because I knew I was in recovery, but I did mine on the neurological benefits of traditional foods, behavior changes, and um, the action oriented nature of food foraging and agriculture and how it stimulates our, 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 our brain. And, um, you know, after that, I was invited to, to do some contract work training the teams and cooking, you know, just like, cool, I'll do it. And, you know, within like, within a year or so, a position opened up with that agency and I, I, I came on board with the Rainbow Treatment Center. So I, I somewhat left the hospitality industry in the hotel world and the fine dining world or whatever. And I, I'm now I'm in mental health and behavioral health. Um, I'm combining my experience with my formal classical technical training as a chef and the international experience. And then also my lived experience of recovery and sobriety to kind of weave this narrative that you see and gather um, about taking time, place, landscape, uh, behavioral skills like cooking and agriculture and weaving this, um, it's not new, but like reclaiming and reselecting elements of our culture that we want to use. And um, it's, it's been this just like freaking amazing journey. You know, like I kind of, I kind of say like, sometimes I feel like the, the that, that character, the movie Forrest Gump, you know, <laughs> like I, I didn't plan none of this, man. I'm just, I'm just rolling with it, you know, <laughs> and all this really neat stuff happens along the way, you know, and, and uh, I'm just trusting the process and staying a student of the experience. And, you know, um, the production crew um, came upon me and asked me if I wanted to be a part of the film. And I was skeptical at first because a lot of film companies and producers come into native communities um, trying to appropriate or, you know, show um, poverty porn or do all this other, um, really not let native speak for us. And um, that happens a lot with especially uh, well-known tribes like white men, like Apaches, right? Because of Hollywood has already appropriated Apache culture in the 50s and 60s. And so we're like real common in the Hollywood psyche of, of, of Hollywood Indians, right? The Cherokees and Apaches, the Plains Indians and Apaches, right? Is usually what you think of when you think of Native America. So we're real cautious about that. Um, but um, um, Sanjay really uh, reassured me that the audience was for Native peoples and with First Nations Development Institute, it would be, um, our audience would be, um, it was different, right? And so um, when you meet me and gather, I'm 22, 21, 22 years into my cooking path. And um, it's been this combination that I couldn't have scripted. My younger chef in training and all those fine dining operations and resorts could have never envisioned like, yeah, man, I'm gonna, when I grow up, I'm gonna go work in my local drug rehab as a chef, you know, <laughs> like, but that's what ended up happening. And I, I, I love it, I dig it. I, I could not have planned it. And I found out that I'm just as passionate about professional cooking as, um, as I am, I'm just as, uh, I've become just as passionate for mental health and behavioral health work as I am for, for professional cooking. So I really, I really feel like I've kind of trusted the foods and the landscapes and the messaging that they give spiritually. And it's kind of guided me to this place to be like an instrument or to be a facilitator of new experiences. And as all you know, the, the action-oriented nature of agriculture is very rigorous, very rewarding, and very grounding. So that's kind of what I hope I can continue to facilitate in my own community is keeping Native Foods Insight in mind so that we can meet people where they're at and they can bloom and blossom on their own. Um, so that's kind of me in a nutshell. Um, there's more to it. You know, I'm pretty laid back. I'm open to any kind of questions and, um, you know, I'm just kind of a regular dude on the res, man. <laughs> Cool, thank you, Chef. Mag. We'll, we'll claps for me and hopefully everyone else in their little boxes. That was super um, informative and definitely gave us, you know, more background than you can get in the hour documentary 
split across many people. So thank you so much for your um, insight and sharing your experience with us. Very grateful for that. Um, so with that, um, I think we'll switch gears and go into a little question and answer, as you said. Um, we're open to any questions, um, please put them in the chat. Um, I will start it off though, while we're um, waiting for, for people to kind of put some in the chat. So um, everything you said, of course, was amazing, but um, I, I wanted to ask uh, specifically a question about like, um, just like kind of extending off of the, the documentary for people who just like finished it, um, kind of where you're at with like Cafe Gojo and like also how COVID has affected like your community, um, kind of keeping with the native foods in your community and um, yeah, food security and, and sovereignty in the community with COVID-19, interested to hear. Yeah, okay. Um, well, when you when you watch us in the film, we're just on the cusp. We're just starting our soft opening activities. And within three weeks after filming that scene, uh, COVID hit Arizona and the governor, mandate, governor mandates a shutdown. And so we, we begin shutting down and our team resituates and goes into other work. So um, we're, we're still a part of the same um, organization, but we're doing different things now. Like for me, I transitioned into telehealth. And I've done, uh, now I do recovery groups and demonstrations and teaching through, through distance, through Zoom. And other, um, other members of the teams have gone into other areas too. So, um, but uh, the White Mountain Apache tribe was really hit hard by the pandemic. And we, we suffered a lot of loss. Uh, a lot of people passed away because of COVID in our community and also on the Navajo Nation. So um, we're, we're being very cautious as a health agency um, and but uh, uh, now the vaccine is readily accessible in the community and um, I think for the past four days, five days, every day the tribe releases um, information about um, COVID cases and we've had no, no new cases in like the past week. And so which is really great compared to in the middle of the summer, May, June, July, we were going from like every week we were going up at least two, three hundred cases to where we were like at, you know, three thousand cases. Um, active in our community. So now we're down to zero and for a week straight. So um, we'll, we'll see uh, if you want to, I put the Cafe Gojo link or the Instagram in the in the chat there um, because we'll be planning more ramp up activities in the coming months. And that's how you can kind of stay tuned to what we got planned. It'll be cool. Cool, thank you for that answer. Thank you so much, um, very informative. And I just wanted to switch gears a little bit and ask you um, what inspired you to convert the gas station specifically into a cafe? Um, and since doing this, have you seen other communities, indigenous or otherwise, um, follow the same model? Um, it, it really wasn't a choice. Um, I think when you, when you come from a reservation, depending on where it might be in America, um, uh, resources are very slim and opportunities like this are very few. And so um, it, 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 was just, um, it was just like, this is the opportunity, this is the building, do something with it. And um, I know from experience all my time, the nine years I spent working for the tribe at the ski resort, I knew that um, their opportunities don't come too frequently to do something neat like that. And um, so and the, the clinical director at the time wanted to do something that was vocational, but not a gas station kind of setting, not like all the junk food and processed foods. And so they just, you know, just said like, go ahead and create a program and we'll approve and we'll tinker with it and advise and we'll get through. And so that's kind of how it happened. It was just the, the opportunity, the building the facility and the team to, to pull it off. Um, so, but it's gonna be real cool. We'll still, we're still gonna sell gas and get a good grab and go indigenous food meal or a good espresso, you know, it'll be cool. Cool. Love to hear it. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to switch gears a little bit um, again from kind of specific things about Cafe Gojo and the community, but kind of going back, you talked a lot about um, 
your experience in the culinary industry, like going like, or in like, especially the educational side, like going straight into like professional um, French cooking. And when you like kind of transition to focus on native foods, like you're like, I couldn't like look up to like my, you know, my mentors in a way. Um, I was wondering if like, since in over your 22 years, have you been seeing many like professional chefs or like the, you know, magazine, like all these, you know, speakers, spokespeople of food, like um, kind of turn towards native foods or try to like decolonize all of their, you know, the way they see food and talk about food. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, for for me, native food, the work with native food has never been a trend. Uh, native food has come and go as a trend in different circles. Um, but one thing that I've always kind of felt and believed and it now can be backed up by facts is that uh, indigenous cuisine is the foundational cuisine of all, all American regional cuisines, all of them, from Cajun to Creole to Pacific Northwest to Midwest to Tex-Mex. And for so long in the early, in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, as America was maturing in terms of its cuisine, um, it was mostly all French. So you never really heard Native American cuisine, uh, Western Apache cuisine of the White Mountain Apache tribe or Navajo cuisine. All you heard was like um, Tex-Mex inspired, you know, Southwestern inspired French cuisine, you know, American regional cuisine with French and global influences, all that blah, 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 you know. And it wasn't until recently, like after the turn of the millennium that we really began to see uh, characters like myself kind of kind of poke our head up through the surface, you know what I mean? And then be pushed back down by, by racism and oppression and bias, right? And, um, but I think what we're seeing now in terms of decolonizing and uh, indigenizing and reclaiming some of this information um, in that part of the bio that you read where, we, where it said we set uh, precedents in indigenous culture um, through the Native American Culinary Association that I, I started, we would hold conferences all over the, in the American Southwest and gather people together, like in the spirit of ceremony and other practitioners. And a lot of a lot of the gathering in those conferences and symposiums we did, that's for people all over the United States. And then they went home and they continued the work on their own in their own regions. So we really contributed in a major way kind of to the foundation of what you see today if you follow a hashtag like uh, indigenous foods or native chef, um, there's a strong choice that someone in those, in those digital threads um, know about the work that we did together back then. And I think the pandemic is, and the Black Lives Matter movement and the, li um, the land back movement is really forcing us all to examine the ethics of our food system in, our, in the restaurant culture and world. So whether or not that's decolonizing from colonialism, still in this examination of us as practitioners. So I think it's happening on all fronts because of the pandemic. Cool, thanks for, thanks for that. That's uh, interesting here, especially like specifically just a little side note, like thinking about how like for one big example, like with Bon Appetit, like Reese thinking about like how they do their videos and whose food they're um, showcasing. So thank you for adding on to that. Um. Thank you. Yeah. Um, my next question is um, more about like the larger sustainable agricultural movement um, in the United States and abroad. Um, but I was wondering, how do you view the relationship between indigenous food sovereignty and indigenous knowledge and the larger sustainable agricultural movement? Um, do you see tensions there or are there opportunities for synergy and collaboration? I think there's there's tons and tons of opportunities for synergy and collaboration. I think um, our generation right now is very conscious to a lot of these, conscious to and open to accepting truth more so than say our parents' generation and their their generation before. Um, you know, I think our generation is more uh, conscious and aware of diversity and and practices. Um, not just staffing, but like the crops we grow, rotating crops and not, not, not monocropping. So, and then I think also too, with really massive global social movements and racial movements like Black Lives Matter, uh, phenomenon and occurrences like Standing Rock and Bears Ears and uh, um, how collectively together through social media and other platforms, we're able to really bring uprising in different, for different topics. 
I think our generation and um, uh, the era we live in right now is this really opportune time to, to do just what you're saying, to vision cast for the next five, 10, 20 years. Um, because uh, the Census Bureau anticipates by the year 2030 in the American Southwest, minorities are gonna be the majority. And in the United States by 2050, um, and minorities are gonna be the majority. So that's gonna cause a need and a demand for changes in systems, approaches, healthcare, legal system, what we teach in schools and how we feed our kids and ourselves. So I think all of this that we're experiencing now um, is, a, is, a, is a big part of that social shift and we need to roll with it. We can't resist it, you know what I mean? So I think when it comes to the agricultural systems, um, having um, doing more than land acknowledgements and really kind of hear, um, uh, retelling and allowing people of color and marginalized communities to really stand on and share their experience of mar marginalization and recovery from uh, trauma, complex grief and historical traumas so that we can move through it. Uh, I think that's really, really needed right now. And I think we're, I think the pandemic has prepped us to be psychologically ready for that. You know what I mean? Yeah, thank you so much. That was a fantastic answer. Thank you. Cool. Kind of going off of that question, and then we'll, I'll uh, change gears to like focus on some of the questions in the chat. Um, like, what what advice do you have for like young, um, you know, Black and Indigenous people and people of color uh, who are like farmers and chefs who are like trying to break into these industries that are like super, you know, white, basically. Um, yeah. Do you have any? thoughts on that? I think, um, um, I think it's really important to practice self-care and to get to know yourself um, because uh, the systemic racism and um, white supremacy and power structures that exist in our world, they're going to be there for a, a while. And if we get overly ambitious to be too revolutionary, we could burn ourselves out. And a lot of these things, whether we see it or not, or acknowledge it or not, they're stressors on our life. And the human body is so brilliant and amazing and responsive to life that we're gonna feel it. It's gonna, if we don't process out these negative experiences and even the positive ones, right? Because tension is tension, whether it's neg negative or positive, if we don't learn about who we are as individuals and practitioners um, and be able to carry the workloads that we do, uh, we're not going to be as uh, we're not going to be in our optimal mode. So I think when it comes to entering these really um, dominantly uh, white spaces, uh, I think just be prepared. You know, it's kind of like um, you you hope for the best, expect the worst, but you are equipped with the emotional intelligence to be able to manage and navigate this landscape, or be able to identify injustices or um, microaggressions and those kind of phenomena. Um, I think it's just going to continue to have to be us continuing to put in the work and leading by demonstration. Um, and I, you know, I think it's changing. And for uh, um, I don't I don't have my own written book, but I've contributed to a lot of different publications and and pieces. Um, one I did write a small essay um, in in this book right here um, uh, that was put out by uh, Stone Barnes, and I wrote this. My, my essay in here um, to you, you know, to as, as young farmers, I wrote it to the young farmers that were in, um, in, in my town that you see in the film. But I think it, it caused, I think to give words of encouragement is that um, be heartfully determined to endure at all costs and to know that your work is extremely important. That as a farmer, to me, in my opinion, you're like at the center point of all creation. From, from seed to cosmos, to soil, to microbiology, to human nature, to politics, to food systems, to food miles, to identity, time, place, you're, you're, you're right there, right at the cusp of it, at the nucleus of that by being a farmer. And that cannot be understated. And um, take that and use, have the confidence to use your perspective and your experience as, a, as an indigenous person, person of color, or even uh, just an American citizen to situate yourself within the larger American historical narrative and look at your work 
as an anthropological occurrence, micro regionally. So be creative, but have a code of ethics. And whatever you choose to put out, it can stand the test of time if you have a good code of ethics and you're leading by example and you make it micro regional and inclusive and what the land wants and work with natives too from the region or, you know what I mean? And it can have the, the opportunity to you'll really give it strength like that. And I just, for me, that's kind of how some of my work has gotten a lot of depth. Because like I said, that combination of the ethical requirements of sobriety and my connection to the landscape, that's kind of like the way I looked at it. I was like, in my tribe, there's never been a native chef before that's been at operating this hotel with a team of all Apaches that was classically trained. Holy crap, this is anthropological, you know? This is an occurrence, this is a cultural thing. Even though it is what it was in this old beat up hotel, but it was still amazing. So harnessing your experience and being creative as, you, as you're on the ride, you know what I mean? And I think that can really, really um, empower you. So I wanna see your works in 10 years when I'm still doing this. Geez, uh, that was a beautiful answer. I'm not gonna cry on camera, but that was great. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll let Amelia ask the next question. Maybe we'll switch to some of the audience questions now. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Um, so Joyce just asked, what is something that you've learned recently that you are trying to incorporate into your work or life? Oh man, definitely self-care. Um, I always heard it over and over and over, self-care, self-care, yeah, take care of yourself and all that. And my cynical mind is like, uh, you know, yeah, I do that. I love my job. It's self-care. You know, I do this. I work in mental health. I know all about that, right? But then someone stopped, stopped me in my track, someone close to me and said, you know what, Nephi? Your job is not self-care, you know, that it doesn't qualify. You might be offering techniques as self-care, but you have to make time for self-care. You have to find something, schedule it, do something you enjoy that helps you build yourself or rest, you know? And so um, that's kind of what I've been working on. Uh, started running this past year again. I started skateboarding again. Um, and I even do live cooking demos on my Instagram as a self-care project, you know? So. Um, it's pretty cool. So that, that's a new thing for me. And I I'm found out I really like it. I'm walking the talk finally, <laughs> again. Cool. Um, I'm going to read another uh, question uh, from, from the chat. Um, this is more like specific to uh, when you mentioned you were the like chef at the ski resort. Um, while you were the head chef there, uh, what kind of di what kinds of dishes did you serve, and was it more like um, you know expected resort foods with uh, native ingredients, or did you serve special dishes that were native recipes um, that would be new to people, and like how did people respond to to the food you were serving there? Um, we we did both. Uh, fortunately, you know, I, I had the training to, to do, you know, kind of Mediterranean style cuisines and I had traveled all over America seeing and tasting and eating stuff. So, um, I, I, knowing the clientele of that come to that, that, that hotel, they come from all over, all over Arizona, even California and even Mexico. And there are people with disposable income and able to, you know, have probably eaten other places. So uh, I wouldn't put like a, a type of cuisine title on it. Uh, we were just kind of cooking like, you know, typical American fare that could uh, satisfy a, a hungry family that was fresh and nutritious, you know what I mean, after a long day of skiing. So we did steaks, pastas, we had rotating specials, um, a majority of it, as much as we could do, we did it from scratch. Um, I had a bar and grill that served sandwiches and um, native specials every now and then. Um, we had a bar menu that include, you know, small tastes of, you know, stuff like sliders and small tacos, but also every... Now and then we throw in native ingredients. But uh, the first part of that equation to get to be able to do that, you can only do that if you got a good team. And the first two years was really about building up a solid team to adjust to my teaching style and to adjust to this new culture that we were building in. Cause we, that team went from everything being instant, pre-made and frozen and an unorganized kitchen where people were fighting over responsibility to being organized from scratch and more disciplined. And so that change took about two years to, uh, for people to, for the turnover rate to happen naturally and strong people to stay and us to grow. And then we could start doing the creative stuff. And then um, I think it was the third year we decided to launch a chef's table. Um, when I was at Mary Lane's, right? That real fancy place um, off in the corner, this nice big lush area, the chef turned it into this really luxurious like pocket and he put a table there. 
and that was the chef's table. And diners would come in up to eight people could sit in the kitchen watching the whole team do their work. And I would be on, I would be on my station watching and I see all these diners having a great time. And I'm like, man, that's so cool. I'm going to do that someday when I get my three-star joint. And I ended up doing it at the old banged up hotel at sunrise. You know what I mean? <laughs> Cause we had enough space and I, we would just clear out the prep area, put in a table, throw some tablecloths down and put a bunch of native books and artifacts and ingredients. And we'd, we'd develop a course, a tasting menu of native foods, um, anywhere from nine to 15 courses that took you on a culinary journey through the food throughout the Americas. And that coupled with social media as a tool that's where we started to get a lot of um, uh, notoriety from Forbes magazine to the Daily Beast to um, just a lot of different things. I mean, if you Google it, it you'll find it. Um, but it's pretty cool. And that, that's what happened. But it took a team. It took a lot of heart. It took a long time, you know. Cool. Sure, sure. Sure. Um, so our next question is from Tori Fowler. Um, are there ways in which you are sharing your passion and knowledge with the next generation of White Mountain Apache youth so that they can carry on the traditions? Yeah, and, and this is important for all of us. Um, what I think what is really important in making our work, you know, me as a cook and you all as farmers or agriculturalists, both of our works are very difficult. You know what I mean? Very difficult, many, many hours, a lot of commitment. Um, hardly people recognize it really. They really don't know what goes on behind the scenes other than the upfront beautiful product. And so in order for us to, to grow our field and make another, cultivate another generation of people like us and better, we've got to do our duty and, and pass on what we have with enthusiasm. You know, even my energy level right now is an attempt to do that because I love what I do. And I'm being vulnerable by doing it and I'm, I'm cool with it. You know what I mean? Um, and I think that's what our youth need to see is, you know, um, capable, happy, you know, functional practitioners that are doing the work and are visible in their work in the communities. So for us, um, we've done a lot of outreach, a lot of the time at, uh, at the hotel at Sunrise. Um, we did a lot of youth workshops in the hotel um, and uh, I got to, uh, it, I never really thought I was kind of making a dent until I, I went to go do a food demo at the, the Boys and Girls Club on the res. And I walk in and there's this big like mural of pastel paints that said three sisters, you know? And it was a painting of three sisters that they had done. And they said they were, uh, they were inspired by what they had seen at sunrise, you know, and they want to do an art project. And I'm like, wow, that's cool. You know, it's, it's becoming recognizable again and it's, it's taking root. So, um, but I do think it is very important to in include all generations, especially the youth. And that's kind of what we do. And we try not to uh, forget that because remember we were all young cats too, you know, and we still kind of are, you know, we'll always be, if we can always have that childlike curiosity and teach the work with discipline and enthusiasm, you know, we'd be a good teacher. Cool. So we're, we're coming up on the end of time here. Um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll let Professor Trotz, he has his hand up. So I, I think you have a, I'm assuming you have a question. Um, I'll, I'll let you go and then I'll, I'll read the one other question we have from Mary and maybe we will get to your other question, Maddie, I'm sorry, but uh, try your best, so. <laughs> uh, I'll be brief. Thank you, Chef, for being here with us tonight. Uh, while watching Gather, um, I was trying, you know, to connect the dots of all those wonderful stories. And uh, what really struck me was the, um, you know, the, the healing power of food. So healing with food, right? And then especially towards the end, this idea of that, you know, we hear the same drum. It really, it really got me, you know, we hear the same drum. And I think, um, and the woman who's talking, she said that the same drum is nature. So I'm asking you, you know, what is that drum to you? Is it the food? Is it the oral stories? Is it the foraging? Is it the hunting? What is to you the drum? Uh, how can we hear that drum? I, I, I think it's, it is, it is mother earth. You know, I do not to sound corny or hokey or nothing. It's literally mother earth. And the, the, the um, Twyla is who you're talking about, who says that 
And um, it is us, our human experience, wherever we're from on the globe, we still have that spiritual connection to our mother earth and we all feel it. And I think we're highly conscious of it now because of the pandemic. I think we really are. And I think when, uh, if the world is vulnerable right now, that means it's a really profound opportunity on a large scale for us to absorb some new changes and create some new opportunities. So I think that the drum we're healing is the call to health the call to action and the call to um, diversify and uh, honor the truths of the landscapes we come from. You know what I mean? Um, that's, that's what it says. That's what it says to me, I think, and have fun at the same time. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be too hardcore serious. Awesome. Oh, I love the, that sound of that drum. Um, <laughs> I, um, uh, I will, I'll hit you with like one or two more little questions. Um, this is one from Mary who uh, asks, with the opening of the restaurant, has um, farming on the reservation changed as farmers see a greater demand for their food used in restaurant, uh, in, in restaurants and not just for like home gatherings? Um, if you could answer that, yeah. Yeah, we um, re remember we had to shut down because of the pandemic and but the farm still operated. Um, the farm got really creative and they continued to do drive up farmers markets. They were still doing um, uh, micro farmers markets or they were doing food deliveries to elders of the, the, the good stuff, right? The um, stuff that promotes uh, immunity, all the colorful stuff they were doing. They were moving that a lot in the community. Um, we haven't really seen too much as far as it relates to our cafe. We really hope that the cafe would keep Native Foods Insight in mind and stimulate that, that network of traditional markets of weavers, basket makers, uh, foragers, farmers, hunters, and fishers, that they would come into the cafe and see stuff written on the menu in Apache or get a good drink or see a menu, see a special, something recognizable, like, oh, wow, I know how to do this and then offer to share or tell us, you know what I mean? So we've yet to see the long-term ripple effect and to kind of reflect on that question, we hope that others will, will kind of follow in other regions too, or ask us how we did it, because we'd, we'd love to be able to co coordinate and collaborate, you know? I think we have time for one more. So we'll close it up with Maddie's question. Um, do you think that native cuisines could become a major part of the American food culture, like Tex-Mex or American Chinese food? Um, Native cuisines already are woven into the fabric of all American regional cuisines. Um, you go to the grocery store, you walk and you look at all that pasta, you turn around, there's all those canned tomatoes. All those tomatoes are indigenous food products. Um, all the chocolate, all the chilies, all the corn, all the beans, all the squash, 60 to 70% of all the superfoods, the plant-based proteins, the all this food phenomenon that we're experiencing, though a big majority of those are in indigenous cultivars. And old world cuisines did not have those ingredients prior to 1500. They were still diverse and stuff, but that's the whole reason the, the, new, world, the new world was found is because they were looking to diversify through spices and medicines that they stumbled on the Americas and actually found what they needed. But it was a violent appropriation and a colonization process that stripped that scientific history from us and replanted a master narrative that is perpetuating the cycle of violence and uh, marginalization and oppression. So that's why following the cultivars is so important. The foods, the cultivars, the landscapes, they have their own scientific history. They won't lie. The migration patterns, the, the botanical history, the nutritional history, the um, anthropological histories, that's the scientific evidence of how vast um, indigenous foods were in North America and South America. And so the foods won't lie. That's kind of like when I say I followed the food and they became my teachers. So um, they already are a part of American regional cuisines. They're just not labeled as that yet. But um, the more that you divert um, support and resources to practitioners that are in these regions struggling in this same plight, the more you'll, you'll uh, the more higher possibility that we'll see native restaurants continue to, to thrive and to, to grow and be visible. Um, keep in mind, but uh, lastly, is that there is a long body of scholarly work on indigenous agriculture, indigenous mental health, um, indigenous um, um, food and history 
It's just not in the flashy context of what culinary world is doing right now or the um, kind of the trendy, flashy activist phenomenon that's happening right now. Um, I'm not trying to downplay any of that. There's a difference from the, the body of work that's in academia compared to like, you know, yeah, Standing Rock, you know what I mean? And who sees that? So um, when we search it out, there's a long body of work to work on. Um, but then we've also got a big opportunity to create more of us as practitioners today. So pretty cool stuff. So thanks for that question. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Chef Nephi Craig. I want to be mindful of your time because I know you have other engagements tonight. But thank you so much. Um, this is really so informative and uh, really great. Um, and thank you again to all of those who made it possible on campus for us to invite Chef um, Craig to come and talk with us. Um, the, I'll shout them out again, the Environmental Studies Department, Food Studies Certificate Program in Anthropology and Archaeology. So um, thank you. I know I, I started following you on Instagram and I see you do those Wu-Tang Wednesday um, little cooking demos. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start tuning into those, but I hope you guys do too. Um, thank you so much. And thank you, Amelia, for helping me uh, lead this conversation. So, yeah. All right. Everybody, thank you very much for your time. Stay safe and practice self-care. Do something cool. You know what I mean? Have some fun. Wash up. Wear your masks. <laughs> for sure. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs>